Hola, hola. Hello, hello. Hola. Hello. Hola, Rafa. Hi, Matt. So it's 818 here in Spain, 1118 there in the United States. And uh, Jim is supposed to call me because he was still in the car at eight o'clock. Olana. Hello, hello. Hello, Mario. Um, we might have to delay the video a little bit because he should be arriving to the winery any minute. But uh, last time I talked to him or to them, he wasn't there yet. So we're going to do it for sure, but we have to wait a moment until he connects. I hope you are all having a wonderful day, wherever you are. It's pretty special to be able to talk to Jim Clendenden, Clendenden from Albon Climat. So, I know this is not cool, but why don't we check back in 11 minutes at 8.30 Spain or Europe, 11.30 California, because, or I can just sit down here and talk for a while until Jim appears and then when he, when he appears. Uh, reconnect so we can start fresh. I know that's not very interesting, maybe for all of you. Um, Aubon Climat, the the area of Santa Barbara didn't become a, didn't actually become an appellation, an official appellation, until around the year two thousand. But the first vineyard to be really planted uh, commercially was in 1971. It was the Sanford Benedict Vineyard. And that is right near the town of Buelton. And it's, uh, it still has the, the cool air and foggy mornings of most of Santa Barbara County, it's still considered, uh, you know, the group one, very cool climate. And when they first planted it, I found it really interesting. They were planting Cabernet Sauvignon and Riesling. Uh, there still is Cabernet Sauvignon and there still is Riesling in Santa Barbara. But to think that in 1971, somebody thought, the best two grapes to plant in Santa Barbara County were Cabernet Sauvignon and Riesling. That's not the case anymore. Um, 
I'm glad you all are checking in. It seems kind of strange that actually it shows me that actually two people are actually watching me right now. So a lot of people have checked in and said hello, but actually currently at this moment listening to me, there are only two people. So I was saying, if anyone's listening, that Jim had not arrived at the winery yet at 11.15. So we're waiting for him to get back to the winery so we can talk. So it might be a little while. Uh, could be could be a while. We might just actually have to check back in whenever. Uh, it shouldn't be long. I'm hoping that it'll be by in the next 10 minutes, but I have no idea. So these things happen sometimes. Um, and the truth be told, we're lucky that it seems like we're going to be able to do a Instagram video because he wasn't, he has never done an Instagram video before. So that's another challenge. We'll have to see if he's able to connect uh, via video or via Instagram. Tomorrow, if anybody's listening, again, while we're waiting for Jim, uh, we have a really interesting guest, a really cool guy, whose name is Ola Almudena. Hello, hello. Um, whose name is Sashi Mormon. So today is Jim Clendenin, who is one of the pioneers of Santa Barbara County wines and really California winemaking. Uh, Okay, awesome. Let me see. Maybe he's here. We can start. What I'm going to do, though... Oh, man, we're going to run out of time. All right. Let's see. Cool. Hello. Here we go. We're live now. No, you're fine. Okay, can you see him good? Yeah, I can. Over here? Yeah. Perfect. And I'm not going to get on the phone? Nope, you're being recorded right now, and he's posting it yeah. um, through his thing. Well, for me and for everybody at home in quarantine and in lockdown, uh, <laughs> at least here in Spain, this, has, this uh, Instagram has become really popular for all the wine freaks to learn and to see people face to face and to uh, discover new stuff. So hello. Hello, Mr. how are Clendon. you? Good, good. Yeah, uh, first, thank you so much for making time to, to talk to us. I'm sure everybody, everybody out there is super stoked. Uh, I had a few friends send me texts today saying, you're going to be with ABC later. Uh, they don't even say Alban Clon, they just say ABC. So do I. Yeah. So, um, so uh, I first, I mean, I feel like myself and a lot of other people, the first wines I had were from Santa Barbara County were your wines. And uh, my parents was, my parents were drinking Alban Clement. And maybe they had a few bottles of Sanford, but but it was like that was uh, in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara Winery, I believe too. They had a uh, some wine. Yeah, they were around about the same time. Yeah. But I was I was born in 1978, uh, which is just about the time when you really uh, really 77. I think you really kind of got into got into things. Well, 77. I was working for Zaca Mesa Winery down in this area. I started a Bon Clima in 82, along with Adam Tomac, my partner at the time. And uh, one of the first things we did was start working on an international presence. I had spent uh, uh, the year of 81 working in Australia and working in Burgundy. And so I learned a lot about techniques that I didn't know before, only working in California. And then we began to get the idea that um, the style of wine we made was a great international style. And almost 40 years later, I haven't changed that. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, you you're the first person in your family to 
to make wine and to really were your parents in agriculture at all or no no my my mother was a teacher and my father worked for firestone tire and rubber company so he was okay. firestone but not firestone wine <laughs> firestone where the rubber meets the road yes, this was just bottled. and uh yeah. and then you went to uc santa barbara i did i did and i studied pre-law and my intention was, as many people of my generation, before I got totally uh, depressed by school, was to just stay in university longer than my father, and then I would have a better life. And so uh, I ended up cutting that three years short. I, I got my uh, undergraduate degree, but I didn't go to law school. And instead, I started dragging hoes at Zaka Mesa Winery. So, so what... Um... What the sort of a, what what happened in the gap there between okay I'm studying law and Zaka Mesa, what what was the spark? Um, I, I turned 21 living in France in Bordeaux, and uh, absolutely fell in love with wine. So when I returned for my last two years of uh, undergraduate degree, uh, I returned to Santa Barbara, joined wine appreciation clubs, and you know took the ultimate risk, which I, I think in life is one of the great ultimate risks where you take your hobby and you make it your career because then if you uh, fail at your career, you've also lost your hobby. So we took that risk with wine and it worked out really well. I, uh, I have not even a, a single regret about it. Uh, if, if I was a lawyer, I would just be a, you know, another large asshole in the neighborhood, especially in America. I don't know how Spanish lawyers are, but uh, uh, French lawyers are actually a little bit better than, uh, American, but the American ones are pretty much, they're kind of right up there in the disruptors of the world, no question. We watched just last night uh, the movie Erin Brockovich. I don't know if you've ever seen that film. Yeah, of course, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a lot of fun. And she, you know, is a uh, super passionate, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, defending of people's rights and, and did a lot of good and, and got a movie made about her, which is kind of funny because uh, I was reading this uh, that Trump has on his coronavirus campaign. His name is Peter Navarro. And uh, Peter was a, a liberal. And he was the kind of guy that in the beginning was standing in front of uh, right. Now he's a super conservative. He's a pawn for Donald Trump. And he's representing science and representing medicine and representing uh, the coronavirus uh, acquisition of all the equipment in the U.S. to take care of it in the hospitals, and doesn't know shit about it. And he's super conservative. Now, how can you change that much in your life? I, I figure out a good, good path, and I try to stick with it, because uh, I couldn't live with myself if I woke up tomorrow morning and, and became an insultingly uh, arrogant attorney in, in, instead of a, a hands-on winemaker, you know? It would be a little bit tough. Well, perhaps you were more a philosopher rather than a lawyer. Absolutely. Uh, that's what the, the, the setting I was doing, Randall Graham of Bonnie Dune was the same. There were four of us who were relatively well-known winemakers born the same year from the same generation, in the same period of high school and university. And we all studied sociology. And thank God we figured how to get out of that so we could make a little bit of money and have a better quality of life. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was just thinking about him. I mean, if, I mean, this for me is a real honor to be able to talk to you. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people, uh, it's, a really, it's really special for them to, to hear you and to see you in these times. And uh, Randall Graham, he's up there too. He's one of those winemakers that uh, I would love the opportunity to, to talk to him someday because, I mean, I got up near Bonnie Dune, um, you know, driving up to Big Sur and, and driving all the way up even further north past Santa Cruz and all the way, all the way up to Mendocino County. And I was drinking uh, one of his wines, this really cool, God, I don't know if I'm gonna remember the name, this really cool like wood cabin inn that's up there in Big Sur. Um, no, because that's the meditation one, right? That's the more sort of- uh, No, no Nepenthe is just, you know, right on the coast, beautiful views. Both sides, they got a great wine list. That's the only reason I was thinking of the And inexpensive, you know, they've got sandwiches, hamburgers, they've got fun things to eat. And they have a staff of like 16 
young people, and I mean, they are tattooed and be pierced <laughs> and totally wild, and all of them have at least the first degree of sommelier, and they're yeah. just so enthusiastic. They used to come down by the uh, by the bus full, and I feed them lunch, and we just always had an incredible, you know, they were they were, uh... and then of course there's in Bonnie Dune, there's the there was the Bonnie Dune Cafe, and there's one in Davenport right around that same area, but Randall was certainly well represented in all of them. Super smart guy. You'd really enjoy having a conversation with him. He's got opinions about just everything on earth. So, um, so yeah. So uh, what was it like those first, those first years of, of grunt work? And uh, I was going to say also, before I get into that, like in knowing your whole history, which I mean, I've read the biography on your website, which is very, not, very interesting. And I recommend everybody to read it. Uh, also, I love the fact that all the vineyards are really well described on the website. Uh, but, uh, but I was going to say that also, um, uh, well, I don't remember what I was going to say. I was going to say something about like, you know, the fact that, oh yeah, that you were saying that how could someone, how could someone switch so radically from one? And I think you maybe agree with me and maybe the people out there who are winemakers would agree with me that I think if you're going to make wine, you have your whole your whole mind is about focus and about consistency because you, everything is in the long term. Everything is what's this wine going to be like? What's the vineyard going to be like uh, six months from now? What's, what am I going to do next vintage? Am I going to change anything? Am I going to keep it the same? Um, are we going to, we're going to plant when you plant varietals, like when you plant grapes, you have to be thinking, is this going to be cool? uh six or eight years from now when i actually am able to even harvest this and make wine out of it um so i think it's a complicated thing what's the most important thing obviously is attempting without being a freak about it to control the things that you cannot control and you have to understand that you're going to get what you get for the vintage so the more experience you have the better we can guarantee a positive outcome for our customers and consumers um you, you have to uh take a real leap of faith when you plant a vineyard. And uh, I've now planted not a huge amount, but a lot of different grapes and a lot of different sites. And uh, you get a lot of surprises. And that's not always the best thing <laughs> as it comes along. But uh, it, it has to imbue your life and inform your life on every level. And it's not just making it, it's observing it. It's tasting something 30 times over its uh, life in the bottle before you decide whether you actually love it, only like it, or it, it's not exactly what you wanted to make. And there are a lot of people that don't do that. You know, we have a huge library of old wine because I believe our wines age really well. And we share them with people all the time. So come on by, have lunch with me, and uh, we'll look at some, uh, some older products. We had uh, uh, my niece who's helping set this up for you, Marissa Matella, who's also our... Um, uh, enologist and assistant winemaker. Uh, she was born in 85. So we drank an Oregon Pinot Noir that I made, interestingly enough, with uh, Randall Graham's help. Not his help in making the wine, but he acquired the grapes and he wanted to share them with me. And so we went up to Bonnie Dune and picked up the grapes. And that 85 wine from a, a great vineyard called Temperance Hill, the, the vineyard was only four years old at that time. So for me to be able to work with it was rare. And I think I, I'm thinking we probably drank the last bottle, but it's amazing to have an 85 uh, and, and to have it in perfect condition and to drink it and look back on it because it was a tremendously popular wine. But like a lot of tremendously popular wines, when people often talk about how big and rich my wine was in comparison to other people's wines, I don't try to make big, rich wines. I made an 85 Santa Barbara wine the same year that was pale orange. And in America, they thought it was shit. And uh, uh, Jasper Morris, the uh, master of wine in the UK that became my agent for 30 years, he tasted and said, oh, my God, it's like a great Volney or a great Fomard. And he bought it, imported it, and ran with it for 30 years. And so the difference in people's orientations is that way. But they tasted our Oregon wine, and they were convinced that the wine was going to die after a short period of time. And I can guarantee you that everybody who made a wine in 85 in Oregon, they didn't bring the grapes down to Santa Barbara. They didn't have the... Uh, tribulations that we had to make the whole thing work out, their wines are all tired. Their wines aren't exciting anymore. And that bottle that we had was tremendously exciting. And those are the things you live for. 
because if the bottle was really, really, really bad, I never would have told you that I drank it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, what's the point? I mean, you can't, you can't fake it to make it. You gotta, it's gotta be real. It's gotta be honest. I think the hardest thing, um, I'm a really young winemaker. I just started, my first vintage was 2013. And uh, when you do have a commercial success, like you just said, the hardest thing is, is keeping those cases, keeping some bottles. I mean, because things are going out the door and, and you're, you're just, I'm so happy to be selling anything. And sometimes, you know, you get the order and you're like, I got to save some of this because you're hoping that you can go back um, and taste it again, but taste it, like you said, in different circumstances, compare it side by side with the newer vintages. Um, and it's really important to see where you've come from and where you're going. And you do. And if you're really, really, really obsessed, fixated and a hoarder like I am, I now have a 5,000 square foot warehouse stacked four high with pallets of my library that I've collected over the last 40 years. Wow. And I have to tell you, every once in a while, I'm really happy it's not um, cat urine soaked newspapers like the old ladies that uh, <laughs> die and their family comes into the house and sees that. But every, every once in a while, I look at it and I go, there's something wrong here. There's something not right. But of course, the great wines, the great wines are the ones that escaped you because you like them and so you drink them. And mm. uh, ones that always breed in the cellar and, and you look and you start off with 20 cases and you still got 20 cases, those are the bad wines. Those are the ones you don't want to drink. And uh, some of those have really surprised me. So that's been fun too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, like you, you, you know, I, I had on my WhatsApp another app I had, you know, life's too short to drink bad wine. And I think uh, before I started making wine, it was on the commercial side of things. I was selling off trade at wine shops and, and it was wine distribution. And my thing was, you know, people, whenever you speak to the final customer, whenever you're selling retail, you always have to dumb down. You can't get too nerdy and otherwise you lose them right away. People just, just tune out. And you also want them to feel like you don't want to feel, you don't want them to feel like they're inferior to you in any way. And so they would ask me like, how do you know when a wine is good? And I would say that I would say, just look at the bottle. If it, if, if you have to, if that bottle is going to last you three or four days or even a week, that that's not a good wine. I mean, uh, there are, there are some wines that need to breathe and, and maybe just out of appreciation, just out of respect, maybe you don't want to drink, you don't want to throw the whole bottle down. Um, you don't want to gulp it down, but you definitely need to, uh, but if a wine, like it, it takes time to drink it, then that's no good. That's not, that's not what we want. That's what the, uh, the French are legendary for, for saying, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean it's good and it doesn't mean it's bad. It's just that when you taste it, you can't drink it. And in a lot of cases, they say that about California Pinot Noirs because they're too big, they're too alcoholic, they're too heady and they don't have enough acidity. And so where um, what I've learned to say, because I had to teach my son how to say it when he was eating out at other people's houses, I like to say, this is not my style. And that's all I'm going to say. It doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's bad, but I'm not going to drink it because it's not my style. And the, uh, and the, and the French winemakers would just go, and, uh, <laughs> and so we, we, we changed, we changed it. And, um, uh, uh, because a really good friend, friend of mine, Mel Knox, who sells the world's best barrels here, here in America and was a partner with me in one of my companies, which was called EC Laba. Mel developed, and all by himself, he developed the Presque Bouvable. And so if the wine's pretty damn good and you're just pounding it, he'd put his glass out for, for another glass and he'd go, Presque Bouvable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my uh, I, I don't speak French, but uh, out of my sense of inferiority, I've I've got my children learning French since they were three years old, and uh, you know because of the proximity, the proximity, they go up to France in the summer, and we get them in a, instead of doing summer camp here in uh, Spain, I always send them there, and uh, and the French teacher who comes to the house. She's just my son's name is Miguel, and she's Miguel. Because, you know, they have a way of uh, any word they can they can make it tune it up or tune it down. They can make you feel like it's the worst word in the, on the planet Earth, or you're blessed and it's the best word. Um, do you speak French? Uh, I I'm do. Pretty pro I, okay, I do. Yeah, I have, did you? Uh, 
I, I started learning when I was very, very young. And then I've spent a lot of time in uh, French speaking Africa when my sister was in the Peace Corps there. And uh, I mean, it's, I, I'm good with languages, not great. I've discovered now because my children have both been studying Japanese for the last 10 years and they're both really good at it and I'm not. And I said, as they were learning, I would learn too. And it's just not true. But as far as the, the romance languages, I spoke really good Spanish when I started my company because half of our workers were uh, from Mexico. And uh, uh, the only reason I stopped that was they had to learn English to live in California and to become citizens. And, uh, and what they've done is just unbelievable in one generation. I mean, if, if you think it's amazing that I started a winery and started making wine and, and now I have vineyard land and I have a brand and all that stuff. My guys who worked with me, one of them in particular, who started working, uh, putting putting labels on in the early 80s, 82, 83, and now he's the cellar master of the winery and keeps uh, all the barrels in, in place, but uh, became a citizen, speaks perfect English, came over and was no English whatsoever, hadn't graduated from high school, married three wonderful kids. Uh, the first time he bought a BMW, I cried, just like he was my son. It was really great. And uh, at that time, I said for all the other employees that we had in the, in the winery that there would be no Spanish speaking in the winery. And uh, it was kind of a dumb asshole thing to say, but I wanted them to learn. I wanted them to assimilate. I wanted them to get a life if they were going to live in California that was um, more Californian. And uh, the only one that really hurt was me because now all the guys hang around and speak in Spanish all the time. And. You know, they go real fast and they got a lot of slang and I don't pick up everything. But as far as, you know, asking where the bathroom is when I'm in uh, ordering food, you know. Well, okay. you got to come, you got to come to Spain. You're, you're, you know, if you need a, if you need a summer course, uh, you're more than welcome here. We'll, we'll make it a, we'll make it like uh, Jorge Ordonez used to do. We'll do a traveling, drinking Spanish course, you know, we'll just. Uh, I don't know if I can keep up with Jorge. <laughs> After all, I heard about that, but I've got, I'm a really good friend with uh, Jose Andres, okay. the, uh, the American chef who w w was really good friends with Fernand Adria, and uh, I would love to go back to Spain. My last trip to Spain was just two years ago, and uh, we, we went to um, uh, San Sebastian, and we went to Barcelona, and it was all eating, eating and drinking, you know. Once I discovered that they like a great gin and tonic in Barcelona as much as I do... <laughs> I was sitting there going, I'm not even going to have room to have two bottles of wine by myself tonight for dinner. I'm already blasted on fortunate times. My dad, my dad's the same way. And it's like, we give him leeway, but it's like, you know, anytime's a good time for a gin tonic because we're out on the terrace or something. And, uh, you know, we're out on a patio or something. And, you know, we, we order a glass of white wine or something and he just orders a gin tonic. It's just so, they're so good. And it just feels right. You know, I mean, uh, we've got some really good barmen here in Spain, uh, and they've t they've taken. It's bizarre because they they can't make hardly any other cocktails. I mean, really, they, it's not like in the United States where they're you know now nowadays. Yeah, maybe in Madrid because that's all cosmopolitan, or in or or in uh, or in Barcelona. But but they've taken. I used to. I worked in video and uh, photography, and I was working for Schweppes, and Schweppes had this contest, and it was insane. I mean, they had like the you know, the foreign version of the gin tonic. So you had like a Japanese gin tonic, you had a, a Moroccan gin tonic, you know, then you had the classic, which is was with some type of citrus. And, you know, but uh, of course, the tonic was always Schweppes, but uh, the yeah. gins, but they always, they let them choose any gin they wanted. So they could do all these crazy gins. They were doing macerations as if they were like tea or something. Um, it's really crazy. Well, your wines are, are hugely appreciated, not only here in Spain, I think all around the world. How many countries are you selling your wines in? Um, more than 30, and it all just wow. kind of depends. They, they come and go, but that, that's not really the, the issue because it's very easy to have, uh, uh, you know, start a business with a young, enthusiastic importer in Turkey. And, you know, you sell 10, 10 cases of wine a year. That's it. And it's the Four Seasons hotels that buy them, and that's it. And so it's not going to grow. It's not going to change. But uh, you can do that. But what we do is, in effect, we export about 40% of the amount of wine that we make. And we make a, uh, a lot of wine. And so to, to be able to do that is wonderful. One of the reasons that we're so slammed 
by coronavirus is that um, we've invested so much time in um, meeting the right people and working with them all over uh, Europe, all over Asia. And Asia has become a really important market. The most recent market that's completely exploded for us is Scandinavia. And for a long time, uh, the Danes were a little bit whacked out over natural wine. And, you know, natural wine isn't wine. I want you to know that. No matter what you think, you might love it. Other people might love it. But it's not wine because we only have one job as winemakers, and that is to control the spoilage of what goes on in the wine. And so it's got to taste delicious, and there are some historical antecedents for what it should have in fruit, acidity, uh, no oxidation. And when I taste the wines that people pass off as natural wines, they're just flawed wines. And uh, I, it's, not, it's not what I want to drink. But uh, I think that if you make wines naturally, we do very few things to our wines. Uh, everything that we do is not automated. You know, we're, we're hand pickers. We're uh, straight into the press, dumping it without crushing it. Um, we're raking it out of the uh, fermenters into uh, bins and dumping it into the press for red wines. And very, 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 very few things. I like to find because I want to use that as a method of having resolution to my wine so that the wines are, are balanced and focused and finish. Uh, we don't like to add acidity. We don't like to add yeast. Uh, if we have to, then we will, but it's not a uh, a, a rule that, that I would say, this is what we're going to do every year and, and do that every year. Uh, and, and I don't think, in truth, you can make a high-quality wine, make, making a white wine green and crunchy and acidic and delicious, not brown, not orange, not yellow. And uh, I don't think you can make it much more naturally than we make it. I think if you make a wine without sulfur, uh, you're taking a big risk. And I can give you more wines that are oxidized because of that, that aren't drinkable, that people pay good money for. Then I can give you great wines that just turned out to be perfect, made in Burgundy or, or made in uh, uh, Italy in the mountains or made in France, you know, down in uh, Languedoc in the mountains. Uh, that actually turned out to be good when there was no sulfur put in them. They usually turn out to be called orange wines because they are orange wines, you know. And as I printed on a label back in 1986, when there was this huge outcry against sulfur dioxide, I put it right in the back of the label, this wine, like every great white wine you've had in your life contains sulfur, contains sulfites. Otherwise, it would be brown wine. And I put on there, this wine, like 62 Latache, 59 Lafitte, and every great red wine you've had in your life contains sulfites, you know. But there you are. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, um, people, you know, Paul Draper would agree with you. He puts all his ingredients on the back label. And, uh, and I was talking to uh, sort of a, a, an apprentice of yours to Doug Marjoram yesterday. <laughs> Doug wouldn't admit he's an apprentice of mine, but he is a long, long, long time friend, partner and associate. He, he, he said that um, with at least one of his Grenache um, that he's got it at four, 40 total uh, milligrams per liter of, of free sulfur, of the total sulfur. That's really low. That's, that's really low. That's really, really low. So, and the, the way he, he said that he, he achieved that was just, you know, he, um, he put it in he put it in um, with a little bit of CO2 into the barrels, large format barrels, and didn't rack it. And he's got it filled up to the brim in cold, 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 uh, you know, barrel room. I think he said the small, I think it was, he was saying 600, 600 liter yeah. uh, format. Yeah, Demi, Demi Mouid, yeah. And then, uh, and then the only time he had sulfur is uh, just, want, just a little bit, you know, he analyzes it a little bit after it's done with the mallow. But that's but he doesn't do it until you know till the following spring, and then uh, just a just a pinch before bottling. Um, but to do that, I think you have to be a very precise winemaker. And so, well, I, one, I, one of the problems is the analysis that we use to see how much sulfite is in a wine it is uh, variable in accuracy to ten parts per million. So if you're trying to make something with eight parts free and uh, you analyze it and it shows that you got eight parts free, you could have zero. 
And we, we saw a lot of that in the mid 80s at the same time that the beginning of premature oxidation in Burgundy happened uh, and for a lot of the same reasons. There were many other reasons. It wasn't just sulfur management. And sulfur management was, was certainly one of them. And so you not only got to be precise, but you have to understand those variables. And a lot of people don't. You know, they'll use the ripper method and they'll check their sulfur and they'll go, oh, look, I've got 15 parts. Well, you might have five and you might have 25. And if you've got 25, that's not negative. If you've got five, that can be really negative. And, you know, I'm not sure what on the palette in texture. And I, I'm not 100% sure what um, it means to have 40 parts uh, fixed in a wine instead of 80 parts. But uh, uh, if you have 200 or 300 parts fixed that you put in, that sucks. Then after yeah. that, if you're, if you're just really uh, conscientious in how you want to make wine. You know, another thing that has dogged me all my life is uh, facile honesty. And so when I do things like cut down the sulfur in my wine, I don't do it for you. I don't do it for my clients in Spain or France or Italy or, or Singapore. I do it for me. I drink more of my wine than anybody. So I was the first person to get rid of asbestos in the filter pads that I know. I cut way back on sulfur. I didn't want lead in my capsules because I knew that the guy that was going to pay the price in the wrong one was me. And there are still people that don't understand that. There are still people... If you can buy them, that buy asbestos because they, they like to use them. There are people that walk out and they gas with uh, sulfur gas. They gas the corks that, that they're going to use. And they stand there filling the air with nauseating sulfur gas. And their eyes are burning. And afterwards they go, wow, that wasn't fun at all. And I'm going, yeah, you can actually have them do that at the factory. They'll send them to you. They'll be totally sterile, totally perfect. And you can use it. When you open the bag, your eyes don't bleed. You go, <laughs> Um, so, uh, what, if I could kind of switch gears, well, and I just don't say one thing about the natural winemaking. I mean, uh, I think, I think it's a crutch, you know, for people who out there understand English, or the, or people who are watching the video, it's, it's a kind of a crutch to, to use it as an excuse to say when you've got faulty, fault, a faulty wine to just to lean back and say, well, it's because it's natural. And, uh, yeah, exactly. and that's, that's a problem. So there, so that's, and, um, uh, and actually, uh, a really, a really famous sommelier here, uh, Giuseppe Roca of uh, Thier Can Roca, uh, he, he doesn't, he doesn't actually like. I don't remember what term uh, right now what he said, but he didn't like the word natural. Um, I think he he said that there was this other word that he preferred, which was you know more like this sort of harmon harmonic or I don't remember what it was, but you know, like every wine. A good winemaker, any good winemaker, should be making wine naturally. Uh, should obviously be, uh, you know, taking care of their vineyards, hands on, and and have a clean winery, and not use any chemicals if they're not like completely necessary. And even then, uh, hopefully, you know that they are not. Uh, you're not manipulating the wine. You're making, you know, you're making something sustainable, and you're making something. Um, as, as close to farm to table and as close to vineyard to bottle as you can. So, yeah. Uh, so I, and, and, and I only brought that up for the Danes because, you know, they were serving wine in two and three star Guide Michelin restaurants with food that was so unique, so wild, so wonderful. And they were serving oxidized flawed wines. They looked like gasoline, smelled like gasoline. And, you know, uh, it's hard enough for me. I can give people really, really, really good product. And there are people who say, I don't like it. Is that the style that I prefer? They'll say, we hate Santa Barbara wines because they're too high in acid. We like them when they're richer and creamier from, from Napa or, or even Sonoma. And it's okay. But I mean, I have to convince people that what we're doing is credible. It's vital. It's something I've been doing for a long time, and I have a lot of experience with it. And I got to work all the time. Can you imagine how difficult it must be to work if you're a natural winemaker going out showing cloudy, gassy, oh reductive, yeah. rubbery, I mean, and, and I see it. I, I went to this restaurant called um, uh, Matthias uh, Dahlgren in Stockholm, and the sommelier was uh, from India, and he was a really well-educated guy, but the entire wine list was um, flawed natural wines. And so he tried to talk me into it, and I'd already been told by the sommelier of the Grand Hotel, which the restaurant was located in, 
that I could use the real list, which was the list that he developed. And I did. I had two great bottles of wine. And uh, everybody else that came in, especially from the U.S., the guy talked them into uh, ordering bottles of wine. And the bottle would be two-thirds full. Nobody would drink it. The wife would always be the one that uh, refused at first. And so they're going away with the feeling, because the wine was very, very strange for their palates, that there's something wrong with the wines in the restaurant. And it, and it really doesn't help the restaurant's experience. So. Well, and it makes you also start to wonder, I mean, like, we, like I said at the beginning, the final customer many times doesn't have a knowledge of enology or winemaking. So then they start to question their own palate if they're in a fine dining situation and 90% of the time, they're never going to say to their sommelier or the server or the waiter or waitress that, that there's a fly in their soup. You know, they're not going to say this wine is orange or this wine is brown or I don't like this. Can you take it back? Um, so that's part of it too. Then you create this stigma where that same customer, that same uh, diner, Next time they go to a restaurant, they're going to really just even doubt about ordering wine or they're going to, you know, uh, be very sort of cautious of what should I, which, what wine should I order? I have no idea. Do I trust this person? Do I not? Do I, you know, am, am I better off just drinking water or, or beer? Exactly. Or, or, and that in part, uh, I mean, I'd like to talk to you what you said about if, if perceptions have changed um, as far as, you said earlier that, you know, that, that the Pinot Noirs you were making back at the beginning and, and, and still to this day, I suppose, are uh, of pale uh, color, pale depth. If, if, you think, if you feel that the wine consumer has become more conscious or more educated. But, um, but, but that's in part, I think, part of the reason why we're in the situation we're in, where many people, if it's, if it's in the United States, they just order Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon. And if it's here in Spain, they just order Rioja or Ribera del Duero because it's the only things they know. It's, it's the safe bet and they don't want to go out on a limb and, and, and seem like they don't know anything or, or they're ignorant or they don't like it. And uh, so the risk is kept to a minimum. Yeah, no, I think that's really uh, uh, an important point to make. And, and uh, it's good and bad. I think if you only order the things you know and like, then you're smarter than people who are experimenting with willy-nilly anything that somebody offers them. At the same time, if you have a lot of experience, what I've discovered is that you have the opportunity to like more things, many more things than you started with. And so uh, I, I, I love uh, Spanish Tempranillo. I like American Tempranillo. I love grapes that I can hardly pronounce from Italy, uh, wine, wines that are really aromatic, especially, you know, all the frappatos and the, the meditation wines that they're making down in Sicily. And there's just lots of stuff that I like to drink. And so I would never repeat the same thing all along. And when I say that our, our Pinot Noirs often aren't very dark in color, um, it's because naturally speaking, they don't always arrive with color. We've had very dark Pinots. We have Pinots that are light in the beginning when they're bottled that age really well and get dark. And the consensus, even from me, is that uh, Nebbiolo gets darker, Pinot Noir gets lighter as it ages. And so it's interesting to to see these things evolve, but I'll, I'll finish with your idea about um, accepting the color that you get only by saying that I know a million recipes to make Pinot Noir very dark, but not one of them makes Pinot Noir better. And so when people are just looking for dark Pinots, after a while, if you're a serious Pinot Noir aficionado, or if you love Burgundy, then you stop doing that just because you'll find something that's really, really, really dark and It'll be hard as nails all the way through, no texture, finish really chunky and hard. And where's the pleasure in that? You know, there you could drink Coca-Cola if you want something to taste like that. Do, do you think that the color in your, in your wines, in your Pinot Noirs, uh, that with the vintage variation, it gets darker or lighter, depending on if it's cooler, a cooler vintage or a warmer vintage? And if you're using stems and, and we use more and more stems, it's very hard to extract a lot of color. Uh, and and um, for whatever reason, yields are the same thing. I would love to say that we're draconian in the vineyard and throwing our profit on the ground. Uh, and, and I just decided 30 years ago I'd stop doing that because it made no sense. And I would see people like uh, Roberto Vuercio in Italy 
a genius winemaker. But I was he, gonna say. He, he's dropping his crop right, right before he's picking it because he's not sure it's going to get ripened. And, uh, and, and fighting for financial viability year in and year out, and having to raise his prices to justify the, uh, the fact that he was dropping crop. And, you know, there's, that's not a solution for everything either. I've had really low crop vintages from great vineyards that, that are light and pale in color with a really high pH, which is not what you're looking for. So I was going to ask, are you, still, are you still using Nebbiolo? Are you still making wines with Nebbiolo? Absolutely. I started making them in 86. And now wow. I have now I have wow. uh, four four acres planted uh, on my own land that, that I planted. I have other people that are really happy to sell me their Nebbiolo because nobody wants to buy it. And our our wine we had a breakout tasting at a, at a great Italian restaurant in New York City called Carbone, and we had twenty sommeliers there. And we had from two thousand, which was the first year that I. Uh, Kept, kept wine and barrel more than four years. From 2000, I think we went to 2010 or 2011. And then I showed them a couple of these wines that I made in 86 and 89 and 90, just for fun because they were crappy vineyards, but the wines really aged well and, uh, and they're fun to drink. And they were also wines that I kept in barrel for a long time because when I went to Italy and I saw that the law said you, if you bottled a, a Nebbiolo before four years that so you couldn't call it a reserva, you couldn't call it anything special. It was just sort of a regular red table wine. And sure. you talk to American winemakers, they go, I can't keep it in barrel that long. Well, I'm, my suggestion is maybe they should be making something besides Nebbiolo. <laughs> um, and, and how is it, how uh, was that first, that 1985 or that 1986 vintage, was that in the Bien Nacido vineyard or where? No, that, that, was, that was an Italian farmer who's right on the freeway in the town of Los Alamos, a cranky, rotten son of a bitch. He passed away <laughs> too bad because we missed him. He was really, really, really good to amuse you if you were having a slow day. And his name was Joe Carrari. And Joe was the kind of guy, he'd look at his vineyard, and I'd say, Joe, there's way too much crop out there. You know, that, that looks like eight tons per acre. He'd go, ah, there's no way that's eight tons per acre. And then I'd say, okay. And so we'd start picking it. <laughs> and I could tell how many grapes he had because he'd drive up with his truck and he'd say, Jim, I discovered something. Okay. My grapes are no goddamn good if they're even one berry over eight tons per acre. Yeah, they were eight tons per acre, all right. And I couldn't deal with him after a while. And so that he was the first new yellow planter. He used to grow emerald Riesling for Palmasan up in the uh, Central Valley. And his idea of a healthy crop was one that uh, made the wallet really thick. And yeah. uh, that was uh, that was his deal. But then I moved to a vineyard up in um, Hollister and it was planted by an Italian American Jewish businessman from New York who was the vice mayor for financial affairs of New York City. And uh, that vineyard was limestone, it was pristine, it was great. But once again, the same problem where for them, the bigger crop was a uh, better thing than the greater crop. And then after that, in, in 1994, I, I planted my own Nebbiolo uh, vineyard at very high elevation facing west in, um, at Bionicito. Um and, and for that, when you finally had the opportunity to choose how you wanted it, were you doing high-density planting to keep the crop uh, crop high, slow? High-density plantings and... And I, I got two really, really, really great clones. Uh, cool. One of them, the, the original uh, Miquette clone that um, Angela Guy's grandfather had planted. And, uh, and that's still where I make my, my sexiest wine comes from that clone. And then they cleaned that clone up at the University of Rochedo in Italy. And they got all the virus out of it and, and everything that was a little bit wacky. And, and they, they call it Lampia. And Lampia, okay. much, much better color, Lampia is richer in every kind of sense, but it's just not taking, taking the virus out as often happens uh, was not a solution for quality, but it's a solution for consistency. And you were talking about consistency earlier. And, and I think consistency is really important because if uh, people want to buy my wine year in and year out, they better be consistent. They don't have to be the same, but they better offer, this might be the tightest, prettiest, most perfumey Nebbiolo. This might be the most powerful 
say if we're comparing uh, 89 and 90, for instance. And it's the same thing in Italy, you know? If you have a great, great Barolo from... Uh, Conterno, for example. Well, or, uh, yeah, certainly, certainly is a possibility, but I mean... From or Giacosa, Gia, Gia maybe, I don't know. Or, yeah, but no, but, but the vintage is going to oh. be so different between 90 and 95, or 90, 95, and 99. And uh, as they should be, because if you're trying to standardize everything, that's not going to work. Uh, it's very difficult to standardize anything, but you can have enough experience that you can make something really uh, delicious uh, in both cases, in a small vintage, a tight vintage, and a large, more voluminous vintage. And, and we, we have to, we, we fight that battle. Fight that battle. I'd, I'd, I'd Are like there to any... lie and tell you, I dropped all the fruit on the ground that's over a certain level, but uh, that'd just be a lie. And I'm... I'm not the world's best liar. <laughs> well, my, you know, you always get end up getting caught. When you tell a lie, you end up getting caught sooner or later. So uh, it's better just to tell the truth. Um, and on that note, uh, are there any varietals that you started making that you did, chose later to drop and to stop making that you kind of said, this is, not, this is not going anywhere or this is not what I want? Many, many. Uh, I'll just give you an example with my Italian project. At one point, I was making 16 different Italian wines. I was making five whites that no one else in California had ever made. And uh, I was making not only Dolcetto, Nebbiolo, Barbera, but I was making Fresa. And I was making all these uh, funky little things. And, and they had no place for me because two things happened. I was competing with myself. And I often said during that period of time, you could love me to death, but nothing could motivate you to buy 10 different Italian white wines that I'm making. You know, it made no sense. So I got down to, to Caifriolano and to uh, and the Nebbiolo. I had a huge planting for me anyway. I had eight acres of Barbera planted and it was wonderful. And I just, it, it was a site that was a little bit too cold for Barbera. But I had, uh, I ended up having, having to graft it over. And, and uh, I hated to give up the project, but I quit after the best vintage that I ever had, 07, and then I just quit. And if I could go out on top, then, you, then you're not a failure. But it was interesting how difficult that was. Um, I still, my, I had a great project that was Terraldigo, and my niece Marissa is making the Terraldigo now, and she's just in love with it. She's a great maker. And, uh, and it's exciting because of that. So often we pass things around a little bit. Are you still, are you still making wines with Refosco? Uh, I, I, I am, but um, Jancis Robinson now denies this. But she wrote a book, and in that book, it said that Refosco and Mondas um, were the same grape variety. Refosco della Peduncula Rosso, not other Refosco. And, uh, and so uh, about... 15 years ago, I started making Mondeuse. I was keeping the wine, like a lot of the Chateau Grisard wines from, from France. I was keeping the wine in barrels six years and playing around with it. And I made great wines. And by total serendipity, um, Mondeuse is now the sommelier's dream here in California, especially in San Francisco. So I've got all these old wines that I've, I'm giving to people and, and I'm letting people buy grapes from me. There's a couple of really new superstar young winemakers working with, uh, with Mondeuse and they buy that for me. And it's my Rafasco. We drank a 97 Rafasco three days ago at lunch. It was great. And yeah. uh, it was the last one that I, I made other ones later, but it was the last one that I really loved. And uh, it's funny. Yeah. I, uh, I think, I think that, um, I think that uh, Mondo's is being used in one of Rajat Parr's new wines with a uh, exactly. he, he buys those grapes from me. Blended then, with blended with Pinot Noir and Gamay at the same time. Some and, and two, sometimes two other things too. It's some. Yeah, says, it's like tres. Roberto Cuprezo's uh, Quadratura del Cerchio, the uh, squaring of the circle, uh, and and uh, I've, I've I've liked the wine. I taste the wine, but his biggest. Um, well, one of the people he helps the most is a young, uh, young gal named Jamie Motley, and Jamie works for Pax Molly at. Um, okay. Wingap. And she started her own label buying 
Mondu's for me at the same time Raj did four or five years ago. And she so comes down and gets it every year and, and she loves it. So, so um, it's kind of like the, one of the, should have been one of the first questions I asked you, but um, what, at what point did you decide you were going to make your own wines? Like you were, you know, you were working as a winemaker in different countries. You were over in Australia. You had been to France. Um, you had been at Zeca Mesa. At what point did you say, I'm going to do this for myself? When did that happen? That, that happened in, um, on the 81 trip when I was in France. Uh, and, and it happened basically because when I turned 21 was uh, 74. And I was living in Bordeaux, and you can't even imagine doing anything on your own because you have to be a duke, a count, a baron. You have to have a massive palace, 250 hectares of vines. And so it just didn't make any sense to me. And then in 77, when I went back, I went to Burgundy for the first time, and I got a chance to see that if you had room for 30 barrels of wine in your garage, you had a tractor and you had a few rows of vines, uh, you can be the most powerful man in your community, you know. I mean, Henri Jaillet had a basement with 35 or 40 barrels in it, and that was it. Had a wife that did all the pruning until she got really bad uh, arthritis and was hurting all the time. And But uh, just incredible. And, and the wines were un, unimaginable. They were so transcendent compared to, you know, going to a negociance business or going to a place where the uh, – the, the effort had gotten too big for what the response was going to be. So after 77, I came back and, uh, and, and started working in the business. And then 81, I worked in Burgundy for the Domaine Duke de Magenta and for Gerard Potel. Uh, oh, wow. Claude, Claude, yeah, Claude La Boost or it was a very the, informative. The, the yeah. Wow. Very, uh, um, very informative. And so then at that point, I, uh, I came back and with Adam Tomac, you know, Adam's father was a doctor. He didn't have the same sort of corporate mentality drilled into him that I had. And so I wasn't an entrepreneur then. I'm really an entrepreneur now, but I was an entrepreneur then. But I also was the kind of guy that pulled the trigger when it was time to pull the trigger. And uh, he wanted to start so many different companies at different times. And he couldn't, he didn't have the, the uh, gumption. The to, to do little it. Old middle middle American word and uh, I have to interrupt you. Great... I have to interrupt you for one second. So it's going to disconnect because um, before you signed on, I was on for a while, and it only lasts for one hour. But I would really love to keep talking to you for a little bit more if you have time. Um, so well, it's it's, it's, it's lunch time. So if okay, you, if you let me go, then call, call me call me back on Monday. <laughs> okay, well then let's just keep it at that. Uh, we can learn so much from you for a long time. Thank you so much. Tomorrow, everybody who's listening and watching, uh, we're going to be with Sashi Mormon, uh, another interesting Santa Barbara County winemaker. Great guy. Jim, great guy. Jim Clendenin, thank you so much. Uh, keep on keeping on. I hope you're all safe and healthy. And uh, I look forward to seeing you there in Santa Barbara or here in Spain. But uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you. And come to Santa Barbara. I will. You can, you, can, I will. You, can, you can look at that old library I was talking about and we'll dust a few bottles off. That sounds really, really good. That sounds really, really good. We'll bring some traditional Spanish food with us to, to go with them. So, okay. okay. And thanks everybody to watching. Uh, thanks. If you have any other questions, you can, you can send a message via Instagram to, to Aubon Climat or to me and we'll get you answered. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good lunch. Bye-bye. Ciao. Goodbye.